quotes. No, I'm just kidding. Good morning, everyone. Today's sermon is on our gospel reading and what it means to be great. In our gospel, we find Jesus' disciples coming up with a plan B for when the whole Jesus thing doesn't work out. This is a continuation from last week's gospel of Peter and really all the disciples' inability to accept the words of Jesus, the Son of Man, must undergo great suffering. So, they take it upon themselves. We'll let Jesus have the first crack. Okay, he's absolutely awesome. Plan A for sure. But, just in case he doesn't come through, I came up with a plan B, they say. How many times is that our spiritual disposition? We pray, we try out Christian kindness, but only for so long. And when stuff starts to get hairy and starts getting rough at work, at church, in our families, then we start to shove using the force of our personality. Or maybe we run away and let some bully have their way or the prima donna have the spotlight. Do you have a plan B? Do you have a plan B to love? when things don't seem to be going God's way and God's not coming through for you with what you want, meanness, meekness, money. Well, the disciples hear Jesus talk about all that dying stuff last week and really throughout the second part of the gospel of Mark, that's Jesus is just a downer. He's like, I'm going to die, guys. He's like, we know. We've heard it like 3,000 times. Lay off. But no, he just keeps going. The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. Upon hearing this, the disciples start to come up with a plan B for who should take over what is in their mind a militaristic rebellion against the Romans. They still don't get what Jesus' revolution is all about, Jesus' salvation. It's going to be spiritual and eternal, not worldly and militaristic. They're arguing about which of them is great enough to replace Jesus on the battlefield as Generalissimo, commander-in-chief. The ironic part about the disciples' argument about greatness is that it is in a context surrounded about stories about where they just are screwing up. They just don't get it. Right before this story, there is an exorcism, and they're trying, and they're praying, and they're going through all this stuff, and, you know, dancing, and whatever they're doing, and they can't do it. And Jesus comes along, heals. And right after this story is another story where they just can't figure out how to heal. They start criticizing somebody. That you, you're not supposed to be doing that. We're Jesus' favorites. We're the ones who are supposed to be healing. And Jesus tells them, man, who's ever not against us is for us. If they're doing good work in God's name, why you got to have a problem with them? Let others help even if it's not how you expected it to be done. Don't hoard God's ministry all to yourself just because you think you are part of Jesus' special in crowd. Jesus explains greatness to them in two ways. Anyone who wants to be first must be last and the servant of all. And whenever you welcome the vulnerable into the world, like the little child that Jesus took into his lap, you welcome greatness, the greatness of God into your life in his arms was greatness. In his arms was a moment of love. Greatness is not having power, not being near power, not being next in line for power, but living in the midst of need and hurt and powerlessness. That's how Jesus defines it. Greatness comes from exposing yourself to the pain of the world, honestly seeing it, confronting it, and not hiding from it. Not confronting the world's pain on your terms with your power and authority, not depending on your greatness, not depending on your amazing solutions, how to fix everything, but sitting in the hurt and the pain of God's world. Empathy, friendship, 
the friend who doesn't know what to say to you, but still calls you up all the same and invites you to dinner and you sit together and you like just chat about nothing and yet there's love there. There's love that makes you feel better. Divine love in you greater than anything of your own making, a foreign entity residing in you. The love of God in you is greater than any plan B or C or Z that we will ever devise. Greatness is handing yourself over to God's embrace because greatness is the love of God in you. It's not something that you can do. It's not something that you can bring. It's not something that you can build up. It's something that lives in each and every one of you, and it's there. You are great, not because you got to the end of the race first, not because you got the promotion, not because you won the arm wrestling match, but you are great as you are because the love of God is in you. You are the vulnerable one needing help and not the great helper. You are the font of cool water where thirsty people come to drink. You are the one who is thirsty, and Christ is that living water. You are the vulnerable little child who knows where God is giving out the hugs. The disciples are learning that they are not there to replace Jesus, but to follow him right into the pain of the world. Every, a very popular theological idea that many people like is the idea of free will. Many Christians believe in free will. Free will teaches that you can choose the good. You can choose to be faithful on a daily basis. Martin Luther didn't think free will was that uh, amazing because you're free to choose what you're gonna wear this morning, whether you're going to be good or nice to somebody else, but you're not free to choose God. You cannot choose your salvation. That's a choice that God made for you. That's a gift that God gave you. And that gift that God gave you, that lives in your human heart, whether you like it or not, is love. Each one of you has it. Christianity is a spiritual state of eternal salvation and daily submission. You don't got free will on one side, and you got this amazing greatness that you can hide under a bushel or not. Eternal salvation, not of your own choice, and daily submission that you do have some choice over. Luther summarizes this beautifully in a teaching that he gives. The Christian is the most free Lord of all, subject to none, and at the same time, the Christian is the most dutiful servant of all, completely free and subject to no one. Eternally, you are free from guilt, free from failure, free from the pressures of success or scrutiny. You are free and bound by no bully, boss, or tyrant. They can merely make you stumble for a moment on the grand journey to eternity, but they got no control over your journey's end. So now that you don't have to do anything, what are you going to do? That's the Lutheran question. You have been given everything, greatness put into you, love put into you, all the things that you're going to do. What are you going to do with it? Hide it in meekness? Hold on to it, hoarding it to make sure that there's enough love for you. Some people serve out of gratefulness. I love because he first loved me. Some may humble themselves out of a straightforward sense of duty. Jesus uh, says it, so I follow it, and that settles it. Some feel close to God in servitude, as we uh, talked about before. Luther taught that once you are a Christian... Once the life of God resides in you as living faith, then you are not one who makes your daily choices anymore. God chose you, and God starts choosing for you. The Holy Spirit, the life of God, the love of God inside of you. It is not you choosing to love your neighbor. It is not, it is God in you and you're just getting out of the way on a daily basis. 
the resistance to love in you, the desire in you to be great and powerful, the false security of your plan B, that's all you, but the love of another person, that's the greatness of God pouring out of you. God chooses you, and God starts choosing for you. Greatness is living unencumbered by this world, living in servitude to God's love. Greatness is not leading, but following. So what will make this church great? A handsome pastor with a cowlick? Getting all our programs back as fast as possible? It's each one of you believing that the love of God is inside of you and letting it out at every single opportunity, whether it's in our building or not. You are the great people of God with a great love inside of you. That's greatness. May you be blessed hearing this sermon as I've been blessed preaching it. Amen.
we continue in prayer. Made children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God of community, we pray for the church around the world. Unite us in our love for you. Help us overcome divisions that we are encouraged to work together for your sake. Lord, in your mercy. God of creation, we pray for this hurting earth. Awaken in us desire anew to care for this world and empower us to support all efforts to heal our environment. Lord, in your mercy. God of cooperation, we pray for the nations of this world that are embroiled in conflict, inspires the leaders to listen to each other and their people, to work together for peaceful solutions to disagreements, protect the vulnerable, especially children, who cannot find safety in their homes or country. Lord, in your mercy. God of comfort, we pray for all who live with mental or physical illness. Help them find appropriate care, bring healing and wholeness when the path forward seems bleak. Lord, in your mercy. God of compassion, we pray for the young people of this congregation. Renew in us your call to welcome the children into our midst as they grow, strengthen their faith, and strengthen our commitment to them. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the special needs and concerns of our congregation. What prayers do the people of God have? Put into your hands Gov, Deb, Travis, Sue, John, Brenda, Chris, Dick, Jane, and the family and friends of Kate in her passing. Receive these prayers, O oh God, and those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. With gladness, we present the offering of our life and labor to the Lord. I invite our ushers to bring the offering forward. Gracious God, we thank you for the gifts that you have given us. And with thanks, we offer the gifts of our hands and fruits of our labors. Find them acceptable as expressions of our response to the life and love that you have given us. Amen. In the night in which it was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. 
he gave thanks and he gave for all to drink, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us for our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Anyone who needs and wants God's renewal is invited to come forward and to receive holy food, divine drink, Christ himself giving himself for you. Taste and see that the Lord is good. All are welcome. Thanks be to God. It's in two parts, so just take it and rip it in half. Just pick it up and rip it in half and take one. Perfect.
Let us give thanks for communion. We have broken bread and shared the cup. We have been forgiven and fed. Receive the blessings of God. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keeps your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. May the blessing of Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be always with you. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you for coming to worship today.